Hey guys, welcome to another Indie Spotlight. Today I'm going to be reviewing Dead End Drive by Ian Kirkpatrick. And this is definitely outside of my genre. It is more of a semi, maybe a little bit in the thriller, but definitely a mystery. Rather than it being a whodunit, it's more like who's gonna do it? Who will be the last man standing? As usual, we're gonna start by reading the synopsis, which I did not read beforehand. However, I did have a little bit of knowledge what the story entailed since I do watch this author's YouTube channels. There were snippets here and there, but I tried to like get as little information as possible before actually reading. And I actually have not read or watched any of the reviews of this book yet. So I have unadulterated opinions, which we'll get to. There's the synopsis. Dead End Drive by Ian Kirkpatrick. In this transgressive, satire-laced debut, a 14-year-old boy inherits his family home and the hatred of all those around him as they seek to seize the inheritance from his cold, dead hands. When Agatha Benedict plucked Kelly off the streets to replace her dead cat, Poopsie, she neglected to inform him of some very important house traditions. The history of the Benedict estate prescribes that once the estate owner passes on, a will reading is to take place. However, the reading is more than passing on a loved one's final wishes. It's a figurative gunshot into the air, an alert to all in attendance that a playful game of anything goes murder has begun. The prize? The inheritance, of course. As if visiting, a storm comes in with the guests, trapping everyone on the property for the night. While Kelly plays catch up on the house rules, once friendly family members have already sharpened their knives. Try as he might, there is no survival if he won't play by the same rules as everyone else. A uniquely funny and dark murder party with big personalities. A coming-of-age story if growing up felt like being stabbed in the back by everyone you hold dear. As suspenseful as Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, as sardonic as American Psycho, and as slapstick as Clue. Dead End Drive is a black comedy and satirical look into the world of nihilism and the rat race of life we all see, but pretend we don't because, let's be honest, is there anything more valuable than having every last need met for life? Not gonna lie, there was more words in that synopsis than I expected, but it did have more of its tagline at the beginning and then the story description and then sort of the comparisons and whatnot for the peoples. I thought it was pretty accurate However, having read the story now, the one part that I not, not necessarily have issue with, but I don't know if it quite pushes it as far as I would expect, is the, the coming of age storyline. While I do feel that our main character, Kelly, does have to change and grow through this experience, definitely a moral dilemma in what he had to do or was you know pressured into doing i'm gonna leave it open possibly yes some coming of age elements but that was the only thing that struck me in the synopsis as like huh i really didn't read into it that much but i can't understand why it's saying that and obviously the comparisons to agatha christie's and then there were none yes that's one of my favorite plays to be honest because we are losing members of this inheritance audience as the book goes on. So it's like, who's going to be the last one standing? And the satire is definitely there. All of the characters are, let's say, amped up personalities. So let's jump in to the cover, because I usually like to start there since I, I do like pretty covers. This one I think is super cute, and I love that it's simplistic. I love the little cat on it. And you can kind of see like the bee and the cat for the Benedict estate. Maybe I'm overlooking that one too, but I really like the simplicity. Honestly, without reading the synopsis, I did think this was a murder mystery, more so like traditional to Miss Marple, where a nice old lady has come to save the day and solve the mystery. However, uh, not that. It's definitely not that. My criticism for the cover though is that the only cat at all in the story is Poopsie and it's a dead cat. I also pictured it as like a really fluffy white cat and this cat doesn't have that same appearance. So for a while, believe me, for a good while when I was looking, I'm like, there was no cat in the story. Why is there a cat on the cover? And I could not put two and two together until rereading the synopsis and be like, oh yeah, Poopsie, that's a, that was a thing. <laughs> I don't think the cat presence was strong enough for me to connect it to the cover, especially since the cat is not around during this event, so there wouldn't be any bloody paw prints or nothing. But I still think it's a very nice cover. It definitely fits the theme. 
like I said, this is outside of my genre, so I don't know exactly how you would differentiate between like something that's satirical versus a pure murder mystery thriller kind of thing. I'd say with it being this nice little line art cat, it does feel, it does feel welcoming. So maybe like it's a light mystery sort of thing, like a beach read, which you could definitely do. Like I think it's, it's definitely, to, I, now I'm like hesitant to say light because it's not, uh, it definitely doesn't strike me as like a super terrifying, scary horror thriller, but I don't know if it tells me satire either. I just don't really know enough about that genre to really tell you if it does or does not. So that's up to you guys. If you guys have read satire more, let me know. I can picture some like weird Photoshop things that are clearly odd, but I don't think that would be fitting for this either. So on to the story. So I can't give you so much detail because this is a mystery in the sense of who is going to be left over. So I'm going to try to avoid character names and like detailed situations. But essentially from the start, we do have quite an array of characters coming to listen on the inheritance for Agatha. Several of the people who are in attendance are either working on the estate and have lived through the past inheritance. So they know what's going on, but others, even though they're outside, may know what's going on and some do not. The start of the story itself, we do get an introduction to um, Agatha and Kelly and kind of just the way that their life is going before, right before she dies, right after she dies. So we kind of had that little bit of emo-ness from Kelly of his, his mom figure dying. And then we do switch POVs twice before coming back to that. So we get to see a couple of the outside characters and then we really don't get the ball rolling until everybody is in the dining room together and they are reading The Inheritance and they're kind of dissing on each other and being like, oh, you're not gonna survive. From that point on, the story really took off and was rolling. The first few chapters did feel a bit slow because you're trying to make the connection in your head of how these characters connect and what's gonna happen because you're really just getting an introduction to the two characters. One in particular, I thought got, what I wanna say is maybe more screen time than necessary. Whereas the other character, I thought was set up very well in a little bit in her first chapter, definitely in the second chapter where she arrives at the estate and then things happen. So each character, this is where it gets difficult because I can't be like before this character dies. I think overall the author did a really good job of portraying who the characters were so that you could really grasp why they are doing things certain ways. You either got flashbacks or conversations that were really telling of their personality, as crazy as they are. We as the reader get a pretty good idea early on of what the house rules are when it comes to getting the inheritance, whereas Kelly, as our main character, has not been exposed to that. He's only 14 and he's very, very, very sheltered. He can't even read. So him learning all of this from the butler and the maid and the cook and all that is definitely eye-opening and he doesn't want any part of it. Unfortunately, none of the other guests are as nice as his caretakers. They are willing to kill a kid to get the inheritance, but of course they're gonna take out the strong ones first, as you do. Strength in numbers against the strength. I really did enjoy a lot of the characterizations. Like I really understood who each character was and more or less their motivation. Like obviously some of them, they're just greedy. Most of them, they're, they're some level of greedy. There was only a few characters where I felt like our introductions were very, very short compared to the other cast members. It didn't feel proportionate, especially for who they are as a character. On the other hand, there was a character who I thought was very, very prominent. And looking back, there was so much more about him and involving him that it makes it feel unbalanced that way and not necessarily that we need to have everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame. I think the only reason that it really feels extensive with that character is because there are other characters who did not get a lot of screen time and even though it seemed like they had a history, they had stuff going on, they were a person and then they gone. So we can't, we can't learn about them anymore. 
Now, does that really matter in the grand scheme of the entire story? No, it doesn't. It really is just more of a personal enjoyment thing. Like I really enjoyed getting to know the characters, seeing their flaws, their past, and their, the lines that they will or will not cross. Especially there was a couple of characters who I am fans of, but I can't tell you who they are because I can't tell you what happens to them and why I like them, but I like them a lot. Speaking of satire and people deserving things, this is definitely not just a, a casual, oh, there's a bloody knife, somebody was murdered. It's quite graphic in the acts of murder or following thereof. So if you are sensitive to such things, I warn you. I am not. So I was actually, I, I, uh, on a, on, I guess on a sick level, I appreciated the, the thought that went into all the different ways to kill the various people. I appreciated it, but I don't think everybody is, you know, investigation, discovery, real crime person like I am. However, if you are and you're okay with things getting a little extra, extra bloody and gruesome and, uh, abusive, then you will like this story. And I guess this is touching into the writing portion of it as well with the projection of satire. There were some lines delivered that did feel like uh, a play monologue. They just had that sort of air about them. And now I can't necessarily criticize it and say it doesn't fit because I know this is a satire and it feels very part of the character to be that way. And there's, there's, there's just a slight nuance difference, I think, to something like a monologue in a play versus a monologue in a book. And it did feel a bit more like theatrical. But overall, the dialogue with the characters was really, really good. Again, it really showed who those characters were. There were definitely a few times where I thought the story lagged and it wasn't the story itself. It was descriptors. Like about the middle of the book, when we go into the library for the first time, we get gorgeous explanations of what everything looks like. And I could not commit any of that to memory. It wasn't in my scope of necessary information. So there was maybe two or so good chunky paragraphs of the library. And I, after getting through that, I've been like, well, I don't remember what it looks like, except for there's a balcony up top and there's books. Typical library for me, the little extra details there in this case didn't stand out. Now, had it been a, like a visual presentation, yeah, I think all of that would actually have some more weight to it. For me, myself, if you're gonna go very descriptive, I just give me the picture. And this happens with any reader, I think we do take a little bit of freedom with what we actually picture in a character or a location versus what the author always intends, which is fine. <laughs> I said that very contemptuously, which is fine. You can picture however you want. Um, but no, that's just because it's our creative liberties. For me, just some of the descriptions were a lot more than I needed, especially since they slow down the pace of the story, which is already pretty quick moving and very interesting with the characters. It's definitely a character story not so much a setting story. Aside from all of that, I really thought the writing itself was pretty solid. There were, and I don't know if this is a tendency by the author since I've, this is the first book I've read by Ian Kirkpatrick. What felt like to me to be run on or just very, very long sentences. Again, not an issue in general, a few sentences where I had to reread it just to get the, the cadence right. And some of them did really feel like they might've been run-ons. I don't think there were too many more errors. If there were, they did not hinder my experience at all. I was really just here for the character and for the story. And it's relatively short. Like it's, it's not quite novella, but it's 280 ish pages. So it can be a quick read, a nice stormy night, like definitely read it on a stormy night where there's thunder and lightning. Cause you will be in the atmosphere and it's going to be great. So forget the beach reads. We're going to do storm reads. That's what we're going to call it. Hey, so my last video file did not save the audio. Like it didn't work out. So I'm here to finish out the video properly. Uh, and I do have a couple extra comments for this review. As I'm rewatching it, I really wish I could go into more detail, but I feel like I run into this issue a lot when I'm reviewing indie authors is I don't necessarily want to give away too much because I want people to read the book and actually like figure it out. But then I don't think me being ambiguous is really helping either. Like it's, it's a very fine line. Like how much do you actually say, especially when you don't want to give away 
what happens because that's the whole thing of the book. Thankfully, I am going to be interviewing the author tomorrow on Saturday, September 17th at 6 p.m. Eastern. All that information is up here now. That way we can both talk freely about the book so you can get some more information there since I've had to be a bit more ambiguous. I also find it difficult to review a book that I enjoyed because I, I really have to get nitpicky with my constructive criticism or just like my impressions of certain things when overall I'm just like, no, I enjoyed that book. I four starred it for sure. I need the people to actually read it so I can talk about it. So overall, just to summarize, obviously I did enjoy this book. It was a very easy read. I don't think the content is for everyone because it does get a bit graphic, which like I said, I don't have an issue with and it's really not intended to be so especially heinous. It is on the satirical side and kind of the over the top, which is what I hope people keep in mind when they go into looking at this book. Everything here is meant to be like a commentary on what it is, not, you know, saying that this is good or this is bad though they be cray cray up in that house. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this interview tomorrow because I, I have some questions about this story as well as um, Ian's other stories. And like I said, I just want to be able to talk about it and, you know, not feel like I have to hold back. So if you do want to check out that live stream, like I said, it's going to be at 6 p.m. tomorrow, September 17th. And if you have any other indie book recommendations for me to read and review, leave it in the comments below. I do have a couple on deck right now. The first one being Ivar Blood and Steel and the next one being The Stolen Kingdom's first book in the series. Hopefully I can get to those this month, but I also have to read this. I just got it on, I got it release day, which is now almost been 10 days ago. Uh, I haven't opened it and I need to review it and read and review. I want to read and review it. I've already read and sort of reviewed all of the other Twisted Tales and I did a ranking for them so that's on my channel as well um, but I'm probably going to review them individually from now on so I need to do that. So we got a few more reviews coming up but that's gonna be it for today's video. Thank you guys for watching. If you guys have any uh, comments even just like like I said how it's kind of difficult to review a, a book that you like and be some and like an indie book where you don't want to give everything away because people to read like it's hard I feel like this is the hardest part about reviewing so let me know if you have any comments or opinions on that and I will see you guys at the live stream or in the next video bye